And starting in the late 1970s, we also started to uh, monitor the extreme right, so uh, current events happening on the far right in Austria. Um, and this is what I'm doing there. So actually a, a colleague of mine and me, we are monitoring the Austrian far right. And what I'm going to present to you now is um, a little talk on the far right in Europe. And basically I'm going to cover three questions. First off, is Europe actually shifting to the right? Second, if so, what are the reasons for it? And third, what can we do about it? So starting off with the first one. You could, of course, uh, make a good case that this is uh, certainly uh, happening, and there are a lot of good reasons for it. I mean, if you take a look, for example, at France, uh, we know that Marine Le Pen is set to at least qualify for the run of elections to the French presidency in 2017. Um, we see in Germany that the alternative for Germany is winning state election after state election is expected to uh, easily enter the Bundestag uh, with the elections coming next year. As we've seen the mass mobilizations of the so-called Pegida movement, and we see and, uh, epidemic hate crimes, arson attacks on, uh, on homes for asylum seekers, for example. In Austria, the Austrian Freedom Party has been leading all polls for two years now, uh, with record numbers between 30 and 35 percent. Uh, also Norbert Hofer, as you all know, um, may very well win the presidential elections that we're holding here in two weeks. And also we have seen uh, a massive increase both in crime related to right-wing extremism and right-wing um, manifestations, mobilizations on the streets. In Hungary, uh, the national conservative fetus, KDNP, has won a two-third majority, has now lost it because uh, two or three members left uh, the faction. Uh, so it lost its two-third majority, but still uh, we see an, um, an ideological hegemony of uh, authoritarianism, of ethnocentrism, and also the neo-fascist Jobbik party is currently second in all the polls. In Poland, we had elections this, this year, and uh, they brought a remarkable result. There's not a single uh, left-wing party represented in Polish, uh, in Polish uh, parliament right now. Also, the ideological hegemony we find in Poland is a Catholic conservative, and as of late, we have seen also uh, fierce attacks on women's rights. Uh, if you look at the EU as a whole, last European elections were held in 2014, um, and they brought about big success for a couple of right-wing parties, uh, such as the UKIP, such as uh, the Alternative for Germany, um, such as the Front National from France. Um, and we have now a far-right faction in the European Parliament. So not only, uh, I mean, we had, let's say, right-wing populist uh, factions before, too, but now there's also a far-right faction, including the Austrian Freedom Party, including the Front National. And of course, there's also the issue of the Fortress Europe, the fact that Europe is uh, tightening uh, its border regime. So if you look at all this, uh, the question seems uh, very easy to answer. Of course, Europe is shifting to the, uh, to the right. But you could also make a case that this is not happening, at least not to the extent that some people believe. For example, if again we look at France, uh, Le, while Le Pen is expected to uh, qualify for the runoff election, she's also expected to lose. Now, I know what you're all thinking, the same was said about Trump, but as we speak, uh, it is reasonable to assume uh, that there will be no Front National uh, president in France next year. Uh, in Germany, uh, the beginning movement has been successful, but we, have also, we also have to see that this success was uh, regionally limited. It was a Saxonian phenomenon. If we're talking about successful mass mobilizations, this phenomenon was limited to Saxonia and more precisely to Dresden. In Austria, while the Freedom Party is leading all polls, uh, we also have to consider that the numbers or the, the election results that, in the Strache, that they have actually achieved in the Strache era uh, still rank way below uh, the numbers that, um, that Haider has reached in the 1990s. Also, um, there's been a lot of media coverage on the so-called identitarian movement um, which I think is way overblown uh, in terms of relevance uh, due to this overexposure in the media. 
then we could take a look at the Iberian Peninsula that has been hit very hard by the economic crisis and still uh, the far right is very marginal uh, there, uh, at least in electoral terms. Also, if again we look at the European Parliament, uh, while we now have a far right faction there and we have three um, right wing populists uh, or right wing fac uh, far right factions there, um, there has been no overall shift from the left to the right with the last elections but rather a shift within the right from the more moderate right-wing factions, European People's Party, uh, to the far right. So, confusing, isn't it? Um, we have put together election results uh, of uh, right-wing right -wing extremist parties in, to, in, in European countries, um, parliamentary elections in European countries since 1980. Now, what can we see here? Um, I think there's no denying that there has been some uh, spectacular success for far-right parties as of late uh, in countries such as Slovakia this year, uh, Switzerland uh, or Denmark. And I think there's also no denying that uh, the overall development uh, can very well be described as a shift to the right. But still, we also see uh, some countries where uh, far-right success has been limited, but far-right parties uh, have not been able uh, to follow up on the, on the success they have enjoyed in the 90s. So what I'm trying to say with all this, while there's reason uh, for concern, uh, hold the alarmism, okay? Um, so of course there are some developments that are, uh, that are concerning, that are frightening, uh, but it's, uh, it's not as if it couldn't get any worse. <laughs> okay, so, uh, if Europe is shifting to the right, why is that? Uh, of course, there's a wide number of reasons for that. And of course, first we can look at the big picture, uh, the fact that we're living in a society uh, that systematically produces inequality, uh, that forces all of us to sell ourselves, to compete with one another, um, to uh, perform or perish. Um, and that, of course, uh, motivates people, uh, that, of course, causes fear of moving downward socially um, that motivates people to look out for people they can blame uh, for this development. Um, also, the experience that, that we're all making on a daily basis, the experience that we are basically expandable, uh, the lack of, uh, of recognition we receive, the lack of acknowledgement, um, creates a desire to, to feel appreciated, a desire for community, a desire for identity, and of course, the far right um, makes certain offers that cater uh, to these needs, to these wishes. Uh, the systemic crisis that capitalism produces, uh, in addition to the increasing complexity of the society we live in, uh, has people uh, search for explanations, uh, has people um, search for, um, for understanding uh, on what is happening, uh, creates the feeling that, that uh, people are losing control over their lives, um, has people look for security and Many of these people um, find solutions or uh, supposed solutions in the office of the extreme right. And finally, the fact that we're living in a society where uh, egotistical behavior is rewarded while uh, people who uh, resist the urge to uh, relate to each other as, as competitors uh, are being sanctioned. Um, and this uh, leads to a situation where uh, the far right worldview um, is seemingly uh, confirmed in the everyday experience uh, that we're making. Then on the political or institutional level, um, we're witnessing a process of depolitization of the political, uh, globalization on one hand, and uh, the, what I call the self-disempowerment of the political elites on the other, the fact that political elites have over the last few decades uh, outsourced uh, more and more fields of regulation to market forces um, has led to a situation where uh, these political elites, the policy makers, are, are uh, experienced by people as, as unable to act, um, as having lost control over what is going on. And what adds to that is the uniformity of the current party systems we have. Uh, the fact that basically that it doesn't make a whole lot of difference who uh, actually is in government, uh, they are all carrying out uh, basically the same policies. Uh, the end of the real existing socialism, the end of the grand narratives has led to a lack of 
uh, alternative utopias, of alternative narratives, uh, and to a widespread feeling that there is no, uh, no viable alternative to the status quo. Uh, the economic crisis, and by that I'm not referring to the crisis starting in 2008, but uh, the crisis starting uh, in the 1970s uh, with the end of this uh, growth cycle of the 50s and 60s, um, has led to a situation where actually there's nothing left to distribute. So uh, while social unrest could be calmed in early years by expanding the welfare state, uh, this is no longer an option, rather the, the welfare state is being dismantled as we speak. And of course this intensifies uh, distribution battles. And finally, uh, the phenomenon of state racism or institutionalized uh, racism, um, the the policies of uh, tightening the borders, of, of sealing uh, Fortress Europe, uh, is actively legitimizing far right policies. <clears throat> of course, there are also a number of uh, historical or cultural factors that we have to consider. Um, in some countries, more than in, uh, than in others, uh, we find a tradition of authoritarianism, of liberalism, um, which creates the desire for, for strong leadership. Basically. Um, paired with what I mentioned before, uh, the, the feeling that uh, policymakers are getting uh, nothing accomplished. This also adds to this uh, desire for a uh, for strong leader who, <coughs> who take charge and um, uh, who ride the ship, in, yeah, very strictly speaking. Um, collective inferiority complexes. Um, this is uh, very much the case here in Austria. I mean, especially vis-a-vis -vis our German neighbors. Um, and this has led to, to a tendency uh, to seek self-assurance by, by seeking distinction from others, by denigrating others. Uh, Post-fascist continuity, of course, this is especially a factor in uh, the post-fascist uh, countries, uh, such as Austria, uh, especially the, uh, the Austrian way of dealing with the Nazi past, of externalizing historical responsibility, you know, this uh, thesis according to which Austria was basically the first victim of Nazism, um, this tendency to uh, reverse the guilt, to blame the victims for the crimes perpetrated against them, um, and the lack of an anti-fascist uh, consensus are also providing a fertile ground for the for right today. Uh, and then finally, uh, there's the phenomenon of, of a collective identity crisis. We're we talk about the Austrian case, uh, the collective self-image of Austrians in the 50s, 60s, 70s uh, has largely rested on factors such as pride of the welfare state, uh, pride of uh, relatively uh, harmonical uh, social situation, uh, pride of neutrality. Now, uh, these are no longer uh, identity markers that you can refer to because, as I said before, the welfare state is being dismantled. Uh, neutrality, uh, the Austrian neutrality uh, only exists on paper nowadays. Uh, and so the social patriotism that, uh, that characterized the Austrian self-image uh, in earlier years uh, has been replaced by ethnocentrism. And finally, a number of other reasons um, for looking at the media landscape. Um, also here I'm talking about the Austrian case, but I think this is true uh, for other cases as well. Um, we find media outlets who actively uh, participate in right-wing propaganda, who actively engage uh, in the reproduction of racist discourse, um, and others who at least um, uncritically uh, reproduce uh, right-wing self-representations. The fact that uh, access to far-right propaganda is now easier than ever, of course, has increased the diffusion of such propaganda. Uh, the, the problem of uh, social media algorithms and the filter bubbles that they create um, has led to a situation where many people, and I think, well, we're probably no exception to that, um, carry a distorted perception uh, of actual realities. And finally, um, especially in countries such as Austria, where we have now uh, lived uh, under, in a situation with a strong far-right party uh, for decades, uh, especially in these countries, uh, racist, sexist, authoritarian notions uh, have become increasingly uh, normalized. Um, and particularly the, uh, the ethnicization of social ills, so what, uh, which is the core feature of right-wing discourse. What, whatever the problem is, uh, whether it relates to the welfare state, to the labor market, uh, to the housing market, um, 
all these problems are being ethnicized, are being framed as uh, ethnical conflicts. And of course, the solution then is always also an ethnical one. So the solution is always ethnical segregation. Um, yeah, and something that had, has uh, had a crucial role, in my opinion, uh, in this rightward shift of the ideological hegemony uh, is the mainstreaming of anti-Muslim racism. I will get back to that later. So, what can we do? Um, I've now presented a wide range of uh, conditions that have um, provided a fertile ground for the extreme right that have made it uh, relatively easy for them to be successful. But of course, these conditions and capitalism and, and all the other things I mentioned are not the only ones to blame, of course. There were also uh, mistakes that have been made by different actors. Um, and I will present some of them. Uh, first, parties of the political center. Um, the main problem here is the, the opportunistic attitude that many of them display vis-a-vis -vis the far right. Um, the fact that, uh, they, that more and more centrist parties perceive far right parties as uh, potential uh, partners, as potential uh, partners to form coalitions with, to govern with. Um, and on a programmatic level, uh, and also here, Austria is a prime example. Uh, we have seen already in the 90s, uh, when the FPÖ enjoyed its first successes under Haider, um, that uh, the, the parties of the center, including social democracy, um, have, uh, have engaged in doublespeak. On one hand, uh, rhetorically uh, distancing themselves from the carriers of far-right notions, but at the other hand, um, adopting these notions, adopting far-right policies, shifting their own policies towards the right. And of course, objectively, this legitimizes uh, far-right policies. Um, also, something that I've mentioned before, the homogenization of, um, of, uh, center, of the platforms of the parties uh, of the political center uh, has created a situation where there's seemingly no alternative, no alternative visions to what the far-right proposes. And that has enabled also uh, the far right to pose as the only real alternative, the only real opposition to the system or to uh, the established parties, the old parties. Um, yeah, as for social democracy, of course, the technocratization of, um, of the social democratic parties in Europe uh, is, um, is troubling. Um, what I mean by that is the fact that that they no longer engage in, um, in class politics, that basically what they're doing is uh, try, and, um, uh, try and contribute to, to politics that let uh, the dismantlement of the, of the welfare state uh, appear a little. So they pose as the lesser of, uh, of many evils. Uh, so everyone nowadays is dismantling the welfare state. Uh, everyone is cutting down. Uh, on, on rights uh, and resources uh, of, uh, um, of the people, but social democracy does it in a more sensitive way. But there's no, uh, there's no fundamental difference to what conservative parties do. Um, then the media. Um, here we have a wide host of problems, uh, first of which is uh, the uncritical coverage of the far right, which leads to an active legitimization, uh, but also what I mentioned before, the active participation in far right uh, narratives, the active participation uh, in the ethnical framing, in the racialized uh, framing uh, of social conflict. And also, um, when we turn to media who portray um, the, the far right uh, in a critical way, also here, at least they provide the far right an attention boost. Uh, I mentioned the identitarian movement before. Uh, the attention this movement has garnered um, has to do uh, a lot with the overexposure they've, they've enjoyed in the media, um, and that has overblown the actual political relevance. Um, and at the same time, while there's, at least in my opinion, a disproportionate amount of attention for fringe actors like the identitarians, uh, media are being very cautious when it comes to 
the diffusion of uh, far-right ideas to the political center. Um, another problem is uh, the reluctance of uh, most of the media uh, to call right-wing extremism, to call neo-fascism by its name. Usually they opt for uh, softer terms such as uh, right-wing populism um, and thereby uh, belittle the phenomenon. And also there's, uh, and the US would be a prime example of that, uh, the, the fact that many journalists in the work are, be, um, are led by in what in my opinion are misguided ideals of balanced reporting. So this idea that you have to represent both sides of the story, even if one of these sides uh, is clearly not only, um, let's say, racist, but also factually wrong. As far as the left, um, I find that, that the left uh, has to get its priorities straight because we're seeing something here that we also that I also mentioned before um, uh, relating to the media. Um, in my opinion, too much energy of anti-fascist, too much energy of the left uh, is wasted on fighting fringe actors such as identitarians, uh, rather than uh, the actors that actually uh, hold political relevance. So, in my opinion, uh, if you speak about the Austrian situation. Uh, the fact that uh, the Austrian Freedom Party uh, receives uh, more than two million votes uh, in the run of election uh, to Austrian presidency is much more troubling than the fact that antitarians uh, gather a few hundred people for a march here in Vienna. Um, the underestimation of anti-Muslim racism is a big problem in my, in my opinion, uh, and by that I mean uh, that the left uh, has largely still not realized how central anti-Muslim racism has become uh, for the far right. Not only uh, because uh, Muslims are now being, uh, being stigmatized, are being uh, presented as the main scapegoats in right-wing discourse, at least in Western Europe, uh, but also uh, the fact that anti-Muslim racism has been uh, crucial for the far right uh, in uh, in reaching out to, uh, to new electorates and reaching out uh, to a new audience that is located more on the center uh, of society. And this has to do, of course, with uh, ideological traditions such as Orientalism, um, but also with uh, the fact that um, there's also, there are also all these debates going on among liberals, um, these, these debates on Islam and you know the, and how far Islam is infringing upon uh, upon liberal freedoms um, and uh, the far right has been able at least in part um, to use this liberal discourse uh, as as a gate uh, to enter uh, mainstream discourse as a whole um, then there's this thing I like to call anti-fascism from the gut. I mean, there's absolutely nothing wrong with taking to the streets and expressing uh, one's discontent, expressing one's rage, uh, without having um, put together a concise th theory before. But in general, uh, I think that uh, anti-fascist practice should uh, definitely be based uh, on a theoretical uh, analysis uh, of the society we live in uh, of the role certain actors play uh, within this society. Uh, and only based on such, a, such an analysis, I think, uh, you can really uh, pick the fights that are worth fighting. Um, the ideological burden of the past uh, and the temptation uh, for leftists to counter populism, writing populism, by becoming populists themselves, um, thereby refer to uh, traditions in the leftist uh, history of thought, such as anti-Americanism, anti-Semitism, uh, cultural relativism, uh, um, a new phenomenon, and nationalism. So it's actually leftists uh, who think that the concept of the nation uh, should not be left to the right, that we have to fight for this concept, that, this, uh, that we should uh, reoccupy this concept. I think this is uh, not one of the fights that the left should waste any uh, energy on. Then, of course, uh, you all know that um, the left has always had to cope with the problem of 
chronicle infighting with fighting each other rather than finding the common opponent. Um, the left spends a lot of energy on identity politics, on distinguishing uh, the, uh, oneself from other groups within the left. Uh, this is, of course, also a problem. And uh, the fact that the left is, all, is often uh, getting caught up in defensive battles. Now, these defensive battles are very important. Uh, Anti-fascism as a whole uh, is always a defensive battle. Uh, and these battles have to be fought. Um, but of course, um, this will always uh, only, only fight the symptoms. And uh, in order for real change to take place, uh, of course, uh, there is a need for, uh, for real alternatives, for uh, progressive visions uh, that go beyond mere uh, defending the status quo. So, what can we do? I'm presenting uh, some suggestions, and while putting this together, I asked myself uh, what actually puts me in the position to make these suggestions, because uh, every one of you uh, will, will have spent a lot of time already uh, reflecting on precisely that, that question. Now, what, what can we do? What needs to be done? Um, and so, I just want to say that when it says, you should, here, um, I'm addressing myself as much as I'm addressing you. Uh, so these are mainly suggestions that I uh, would have hoped someone uh, had made to me once I started out as an anti-fascist many, many moons ago. The first one, um, in fact, it has already been mentioned, uh, don't panic, uh, stay away from alarmism. Uh, don't be afraid. Now, I know, especially the don't be afraid part is easier said than done because there are good reasons to be afraid. I'm afraid myself. But as we all know, uh, being afraid uh, makes you passive. And of course, what we need to do um, is act up. And so we should at least try and help each other uh, to not be afraid. Yeah, this. Uh, has also been mentioned, I think that uh, that uh, leftist anti-fascist practice has always uh, needs to be based on uh, theoretical analysis. Um, only then will we, will we be able to identify um, what fights we can fight and how we can win them. Um, of course, uh, the analysis shouldn't go uh, to such lengths as to uh, prevent you from acting at all, which is the case in some sectors of the left. Um, by this I mean that of course it is our task to, uh, to portray the far right, to uh, enlighten the public, if you will, uh, about uh, what they are, who they are, what they think, but I think uh, it makes little sense uh, to demonize uh, the ideological opponent uh, because it makes it very easy for them um, to present the claims that we make about them as false uh, and to present themselves as actually uh, very normal people. And that's what, they, that's what they are. They are very normal and the fact that they're being normal uh, is a big part of the problem. Uh, we have to be aware of the fact that uh, the far right, the right-wing ideology, uh, is constantly evolving and is changing. Of course, the ideological core always stays the same. Authoritarianism, uh, the claim of inequality of human beings. Uh, so this is the constant core, but they are always adjusting. They're adjusting their the modes of action. Uh, they are reframing their ideas. They are modernizing their rhetoric. Uh, we're seeing that as we speak with uh, with this segment of the, of the right that is often referred to as the new right. Uh, what's new about them is, of course, certain modes of action borrowed from the left, um, certain, uh, certain terms that, are now, uh, that have been replaced, uh, but we have, to, uh, we have to be aware of this, this constant uh, evolution. Yeah, uh, calling the phenomenon by its name means, on one hand, um, we should, of course, stay away from what uh, most of the media do, from calling neo-fascists uh, populists or uh, Asylkritiker, as Germany was coined in uh, Germany, I think. But it also means 
uh, we should stay away from um, from using uh, too strong a term if it is not warranted. So I think it is counterproductive uh, to label um, every uh, racist as a Nazi because he isn't because it devalues the term um, and it uh, objectively relativizes the crimes of the Nazis. Yes, I also said that before. Uh, there's only so much time uh, we can spend on activism. There's only so much energy we have. We have to take care of ourselves, uh, of our resources, of our needs. Uh, and this makes it uh, particularly important uh, to uh, deliberately pick the fights that we engage in. Um, I alluded before to this, um, to this process of normalization of, uh, of right-wing notions, the normalization of racism. Um, I think it is important to fight this normalization, to actively engage uh, in denormalizing these notions, to point scandals out as what they are as scandals, especially frustrating in Austria, uh, because in Austria it really takes a lot for the public to perceive something as a scandal, uh, and it is um, yeah, it's frustrating to do that again and again, but uh, I think it is indispensable. And of course, we have to try and reset the political agenda. We're living in a situation where in Austria, um, the parties that are represented in the Austrian parliament, uh, there's now, I think you can say there's now a consensus that there is such a thing as a problem with integration, a problem with assimilation, uh, a foreigner problem, and what is discussed is not whether this problem exists or not, but what is discussed is uh, basically how bad it really is and how to solve it. Um, I think it doesn't make uh, a lot of sense to waste uh, much energy on fighting over terms, especially if you're talking about terms like the nation or the homeland. I think we should leave to the right what's rightfully theirs. Uh, and these terms would, uh, would fit that bill, I think. Um, I think it is more important to fight over frames. Um, I said before that uh, what, the, what the far right is doing uh, is framing all conflict as ethnic conflict. We have to propose other frames. We have to point out uh, that uh, we have to we have to point out that the conflicts um, that we are experiencing have a lot to do uh, with class, have a lot to do with gender, and are uh, and are not such a, uh, as the right uh, claims are not ethnic conflicts, really. Um, there, often you will hear uh, leftists complaining uh, that the far right uh, is borrowing, is copying, is hijacking uh, leftist ideas, leftist modes of action, leftist terms. Uh, but I think uh, when we experience that, uh, we should really um, see this as a reason to evaluate our terms, our notions, uh, our modes of action, because if it was possible for the far right to hijack them, and incorporate them into, uh, into their political practice, there must, be something, uh, there must have been something wrong with them in the first place. And we should probably let them go. Um, often you will hear calls for a stricter, stronger repression against the far right, you know, um, uh, reinforce uh, the legislation against the far right, uh, crack down on right-wing groups, crack down on right-wing manifestations, um, and I'm not saying that the legislation we have here in Austria, um, that this is not important, I think we need it, yeah. But leftists, anti-fascists, always should be very careful when they call for repression because it will very probably come back to bite them in the ass. And we've seen that a lot of times. Yeah, this is something that we're doing right now as we speak. Um, it is now common knowledge that uh, the far right uh, is is engaging increasingly in cross-border cooperations. Um, and of course, we have to do the same if we want to fight them. And I think that uh, events such as this one uh, are an important step towards the goal. By diversify, I mean that the left, that the anti-fascist movement, has to become more diverse. Um, less white, for example. Uh, less hetero, for example. Um, and one step uh, towards achieving that 
uh, would be to build and maintain alliances with the people uh, mainly targeted by the extreme right, people of color, for example, LGBT people. Um, another step would be to actually actively side with the uh, victims of right-wing uh, harassment, of right-wing aggression. Uh, this means if a far-right mob attacks a mosque, of course I would expect anti-fascists to defend the mosque and the people in it. But this, of course, doesn't mean uh, that we have to relinquish uh, basics of radical thought, such as the criticism of, re of religion. Um, if the core agenda of the far right is to ethnicize social conflict, what we have to do is de-ethnicize our own rhetoric and, and analyses um, and replace them uh, with other identifications, uh, yeah, such as class, for example. Um, However, something that we uh, probably could, uh, we could encounter by doing that is that uh, it will turn out that most of us are actually uh, middle class people stemming from high educated families. So we probably would have to start out with the class analysis of the movement itself. Um, but I think the, uh, this category of analysis, the, the class category, uh, should be strengthened. Um, there's no doubt that there's a lot of good reasons uh, to be enraged, a lot of good reasons uh, to be outraged. And I think, well, what the far right is doing, what is part of their success, is they provide an outlet for that rage. Uh, not all of which is justified, so there's a lot of, um, of uh, rage that should probably uh, not get an outlet, not be provided an outlet from, uh, from the left. But as far as uh, we're talking about rightful rage, uh, it is part of the task of the left provide outlets for that. Um, I think uh, what anti-fascists have to do is realize that while anti-fascist struggles are important, there are also other struggles that are important. Uh, and I think one thing that makes anti-fascism particularly attractive, especially for white men, um, is the fact that while engaging in anti-fascist activities, uh, in confronting Nazis, uh, they are, you know, they are on the side of everything that's that's beautiful and good. Uh, while when you engage in anti-racist struggles, uh, in anti-sexist struggles, uh, white, ma white males, of course, uh, have to start checking their own privilege. And of course, uh, it is more comfortable uh, to fight Nazis than to do that. Uh, but these other struggles. Uh, should be, first they should be seen, should be respected, and they should be actively supported. Yeah, which also leads me to this. Uh, I've spoken about building and maintaining alliances before. Uh, alliances with victims uh, of right-wing aggression, uh, but also alliances across different movements. Uh, alliances with the anti-ableism movement, the anti-masculinism uh, movement, and others. Yeah, I think I don't have to comment on this one. This should be a given. Uh, however, I know, and we all know, that uh, while the left as a whole uh, has grown accustomed to incorporating anti-sexist claims into the leaflets and pamphlets, uh, anti-sexist pro-feminist practice is a whole different story, uh, which is why I find it extremely important and uh, that the UH has uh, scheduled to uh, two slots of this uh, of this conference, of this Congress, um, for inputs from the, uh, the family friends from Leipzig. One which is taking place parallel to this workshop, and one that is taking place in the evening in the adjacent lecture hall, um, where these issues of uh, anti-sexist struggles within the movement, not only against the ideological opponent, will be addressed. Yeah, um, almost at the end of this presentation. Um, you may call me essentialist, but I think there's some uh, basic needs that we all share, such as those that I've listed here. Uh, so we all, we all are looking for, for that. We all want that. Um, and what the far right does is provide, is cater to these emotions, cater to these needs. Uh, and provide answers for the questions associated with these needs. 
Uh, of course, these are answers that are wrong. These are answers that are uh, based on segregation, on exclusion. Um, and against that background, what we have to do uh, is develop uh, and popularize uh, alternative narr uh, narratives, alternative utopias that take into account these needs uh, and provide uh, answers that are or that can be uh, perceived as more plausible than the answers the far right uh, is presenting. So I'd like to end by um, asking you to participate in this. Yeah. And yeah, so there's nothing left but thank for your attention. And I'm looking forward to discussion questions if you have some. Thank you.